Good afternoon and welcome to today's lecture sponsored by SFI. It's on the understanding of science of honeybee swarms. So from a beekeeping perspective, we need to take a look at what actually causes honeybees to swarm. Well, firstly, it's a natural instinct to reproduce. It could be lack of space, either in the brood box or in the supers, or ultimately it could be the age of the queen. Bees, like every other creature, have to reproduce, and they've existed for millions of years without the help of the beekeeper. So their natural instinct then is to make sure that the colony genetics survives and the colony survives as a result of it. Certain things can trigger swarming. Lack of space would be the first one. That could be no room in the supers for the bees to make honey or in the brood nest for the queen to lay. Or the brood nest could get clogged with honey and or pollen and then the bees just decide, lads, this isn't suitable for us anymore. We need to find an alternative location. Congestion. Congestion inside the colony also happens as a result of too many young bees hanging around inside in the box, like teenagers hanging out at the corner. And once that congestion or that level, the, the, the colony gets to that level of congestion, the queen's pheromone doesn't get spread around the colony as easily as it should do as a result of the congestion and therefore because those bees have not got the pheromone in the right quantity they're going to start the swarming process as well and if you have more than 50 percent of the bees in the colony under eight days old again that will lead to the congestion we've just spoken about and it will trigger that swarming instinct if we take a look at this graph here it's the relationship between young bees and old bees in a colony. So if we stop and think about the end of February, start of March, down here and this corner here, we are going to have at that point in time, most likely more brood inside in the colony than we are adult bees. And this is the crucial time of the year when colonies that have been struggling through winter will actually die out. Now, there are is more brood here than bees for that, per, that period of time, but eventually it's going to balance out again. Now, our problem here with congestion then is that if there's more than 50% of the young bees under eight days old inside in the colony over around this period of he, here, around the May mark, then our colony will start swarming. We're ultimately looking for the maximum amount of bees to be in the colony um, on the 21st of June. And if we can get the maximum amount of brood and the maximum amount of bees in the colony around the 21st of June, the brood will hatch out and we will have loads of foraging bees to bring in our honey flow. So ultimately, our goal is to keep the bees in the box um, for the season and not to let them out of it. We want the maximum amount of brood inside in the box by the 21st of June. Therefore, we should have enough of bees there to either ripen the honey or forage for honey in July when the bulk of the honey comes into the boxes. So here we see the relationship between the adult bees and the brood um, in relation to swarming. Age of the queen is another thing that can cause um, swarming to start. And ultimately, we spoke there about the congestion and the lack of queen pheromone going around the colony. And the queen pheromone consists of these four main um, chemicals, 9-ODA, 9-HDA, HOB and HVA. So what does all that mean? Well, ultimately, if we have a new queen in year one, she will be releasing up to 5,000 micrograms of uh, queen pheromone but it declines exponentially as she gets older. So in year two, that's going to half. In year three, it reduces again. So usually between year two and year three in most colonies these days, the queens end up getting replaced. But in theory, those queens could last for four to five years, depending on the strain of bee inside the box. 
ultimately, the queen pheromone is a pheromone given off by the bee. And where does she generate that queen pheromone from? Well, it's there's a lot of places within the bee that she actually uh, generates the queen pheromone. It's coming from the mandibular glands, which are in the head, the rainer bowman glands, which are here in the back. She's got sting sheath glands here as well, mostly used for mating, and the tarsal glands. So she's got three pairs of legs, that's six legs, and she's walking around on top of the frames. And by doing so, she's spreading her pheromone around on top of the frames. On top of that, the bees that are in the court attending her are touching her and cleaning her with their antenna. And those antenna are also passing the queen pheromone around inside in the colony. Just to remind you about the development of the queen within the colony. So as every other female is laid in the colony, the queen is also laid in as an egg on day one. And as that egg on day one, it's laid into a queen cell instead of into just a, a, a brood frame. Now, the queen cell is normally made on the brood frame or extending or protruding off the brood frame. But on day three, like every other female egg that's laid, the egg is going to hatch. Now, from day three then to day seven, the queen cell will be fed a completely different food. And at the end of day seven, that queen cell will be capped. On day 16, the queen emerges. Now, what is the significance of this? If we clip and mark our queen, we just need to do inspections about every nine to 10 days. If we don't clip and mark the queen, we will have to go back every seven days for this to happen because as soon as that queen cell is capped, the bees swarm out. So we would need to go back every seven days because at the end of day seven, start of day eight, the queen cell gets capped. If she's not clipped, it'll have to be examined every seven days. If the queen inside the colony is clipped, we can push it out to nine or 10 day inspections. So say we pushed it out to 10 day inspections and we missed a queen cell that had started, um, was in here between day three and day four. If we're on 10 day inspections and we had 10 days to day four, it brings us up to day 14. So we would come back to the colony after 10 days and what you'll see is sealed queen cells about to hatch inside in the colony. So this is why the beekeeper does the inspections um, seven days, every seven days if the colony, if the queens, if the queen in the colony is not clipped and every 10 days if the queen in the colony is clipped. So how do I know the bees are going to swarm? Does it just happen or am I given very subtle warning signs in advance? Firstly, I would say watch your hive records and every beekeeper should keep hive records on the development of the colony. When did you add the last super? Did the queen have enough of room to lay? You would be going through Hooper's questions here and is, has the queen got enough room to lay? Does they, do they have enough room to store the honey, to dry the honey? Um, have they got plenty of space? So the old adage is you over super early and you under super late. So in, in April and May, I would say put on plenty of boxes for the honey and don't be waiting for the bees to cap anything. Just keep giving them boxes as they need it. Basically, as soon as the boxes are drawn, give them another box. They won't go into it and they won't use it if they don't want it. But what you're ultimately doing is giving them plenty of honey to dry out the honey and ripen it. So I would watch my hive records and I would mark up on my hive records all activities done the week before. Six weeks before they even think about making queen cells, you will find drones being laid up inside the colonies. This is telling you, you've got your text message at this point. Their bees are telling you that they're getting ready to go swarming in six weeks time. So once you see drones being laid up, that means that the balance of the colony is good. It means that they're able to maintain and feed the drone brood. You should have spare boxes, plenty of wax, plenty of frames ready to go as soon as you see the drones being laid up. And if you haven't got it, you need to get it straight away. Um, you've got the warning, six weeks time, we're going to be throwing shapes at swarming if we're going to swarm. And obviously, the obvious one then, if you missed all that, is you would be looking for queen cells started inside in the colony. 
And you never, ever cut down a queen cell until you found the old queen and you know she's actually there. So what happens if they start or when they start making queen cells? Firstly, once they start making queen cells, they will slim the queen down for swarming. So the queen was nice and fat, wandering around on the frames and she was walking slowly and she was very easy to see. Now they're going to slim her down because they want her to lose a small bit of weight to get ready for the flight. Remember, she didn't fly since she got mated. Once she got mated, she stayed inside in the box and started laying eggs. So she hasn't been out flying in quite some time and they need to slim her down for swarming. So on day eight, after the queen cell, after the egg is laid inside in the queen cell, that queen cell will now be capped on day eight and the bees will come out the door of the box. So that's five days after the egg has turned into a larvae it will be capped. The old queen is going to take, take off with over 50% of the colony. And if she goes with 50% of the colony, your crop of honey for the season is gone as well. How do I prevent swarming? You don't. You ultimately need to super your hive and give them plenty of room. And what I mean by that is give them plenty of supers so that they can draw out the wax, they can spread the honey as thin as possible inside in that wax and they can get it dried out. Do not wait in, in April and May for a super frame to be capped before you add more boxes to your colony. That's really defeating the purpose. You over super early in the season. The bees need room to dry out and store the honey. And they also need room for the queen to lay. So there has to be room in the brew box. There has to be room in the supers. My recommendation is to clip and mark your queen. It's going to give you that couple of extra days grace when we get to swarming season. So what do I need to clip and mark the queen? Well, on the left here, we have what's called a one-handed queen catcher, and we've got a spring return scissors in the diagram on the right. And again, there are other tools available on the market. Some of them are seen here. Markers. We have a color coding for the queens. Um, it's fine if you only have one or two colonies, you're going to know everything there is to know about the bees. But once you get up over a certain number, you're going to be inclined to forget what year was that queen born. Hive records can get lost. So we have a color coding for the, um, the years that those queens were, gotten, were, were produced. So if the year is starting in or ending in a one, it will be white, two, it will be yellow. So in other words, for 2022, we marked the queens yellow. For 2023, a queen born and mated in 23 will be marked red. If I come to a colony in April and there is an unmarked queen inside there, she will be a 2022 queen. So I'll mark that one yellow, but all bees raised in 2023 will be red. 2024 green, 2025 blue, 26, 2026 we're back to white again, 27 yellow, 28 red, 29 green and 2030 we're back to blue. The beauty of this system, like beekeepers often keep their hive records under the crown board or just above the crown board under the roof and the wind could easily carry them or they could get chewed by slugs or something could go wrong. So even if you lose your hive records, you will still know if you follow the marking system here, what year the queen was. However, if you're somebody that's colorblind and doesn't recognize some of those colors, just pick a color that you can recognize. I've put the queen into the one handed queen catcher um, and this tool is ideal for somebody that just needs to clip and mark the queen. So I'm getting the marker out there now and um, I'm going to put a blue dot on her back. Now always check to make sure that your marker is working properly like I did over there. Otherwise you'll get a blue blob on top of the queen. So you just need to make sure that she's in position inside in the queen catcher. Now my one is a bit worn out because it's being used a lot. 
um, but the new ones would be a lot more solid and they'd jam her in a bit more. So she simply got a blue dot now on her back, put away the marker, and I'll take the spring operated scissors, I'll push up the bottom of the queen catcher and she'll back up into the um, slots. And once her wing sticks up then, I can take about a third off one wing, job done. Now all I need to do is release her back onto the frame that she came off of. And I'll just turn, there she is, with her dot on her back. I'm just going to turn it back up, upside down, open the bottom section of it and push down the plunger and she will come away down onto the frame that I found her on and she'll disappear into the hive with the rest of the bees. So there she goes, blue dot walking around the place and into the box. That's my queen clipped and marked in that colony and that colony now needs a Okay, before we start looking at queens and queen cells, let's recap on what um, we expect to find inside in the brood nest. So looking at the section here out of a brood nest, I, these are the cells inside in the brood nest. They're polished by the bees and they use propolis to polish the back of the cells to sterilize them and get them ready for the queen to lay eggs in. And here, this small white thread that you're looking at here is an egg. So if you're one of those people that needs reading glasses, you really need to wear those reading glasses underneath the veil to see what's going on. So that's an egg, that's an egg, and this is an egg. Here on the left-hand side of the screen, we have some white substance. That white substance is called brood food. And here the egg is hatched into a larvae. It's a small little C, you can see it there. And this is the larvae after hatching out of the egg. Again, we have another larvae after hatching out of an egg here. And there's a bigger one here, a day or two older after hatching out of the egg here. And this one down here on the bottom right is bigger again. So it's just that bit older than the one that's over here on the left. So under normal circumstances inside the brood nest, this is what we're looking for. If we're looking for eggs or we're looking for larvae. Now, here is a piece of a brood nest. We can see the brood is over here. And here is a queen cup that the bees have drawn out, but there is no egg in that particular queen cup right now. So they do make these cups or play cups um, as practice as well. And you will find these inside in the colony. So you do need to look carefully into them to make sure that there isn't an egg inside in them. Once the egg is inside in them, they're what we class as charged queen cells. And once the egg is laid up, it's going to be very hard to stop that swarming initiative. So here we have um, a larvae floating in a huge amount of brood food compared to the last one we looked at. And this is the start of a queen cell. And we have two more here. This is off a grafting bar. But again, you can see that the, this, it's, it's got plenty of royal jelly. And that's the food that they feed queens, which is different to the brood food that they feed ordinary workers. And again, the larvae is floating there on the top of the royal jelly. It's a clearer photograph here where you can see this larvae is bigger. It's a day or two older. And this is a smaller larvae here. And here we can see even those small little spiracles there, the breathing tubes of the larvae. It's lying on its side and it's breeding from one side only. So here again is a charged queen cell on the bottom of a frame there. And there's larvae and tons of brood food inside in that frame. But our queen cell can take any shape. It can be a peanut shape. In this case now, the cell is sealed. So we really very much doubt that the queen is still inside in this colony when you get to this. So if the bees are all clustering, like the teenagers hanging out of the corner, and you need to brush them off gently to get them off this and don't shake the queen cell to make sure that you've got all the queen cells when you go looking for them. Here we see what we class as scrub queen cells. This may have been a nuke where the queen got damaged and now you're seeing um, these queen cells uh, very, very small. You're going to have in 
insufficiently sized queens out of them, but they are scrub queen cells and uh, you want to be careful that these are not on the frame as well. So it would be very important that you get all the bees out of your way to inspect it properly. Here we have another queen cell here again, just to give you an idea, this one is sealed. Um, and we need to make sure that the, there's actually a queen still inside in this box before we do anything. Once the queen cell is sealed, the, be, the queen may or may not be there. If that's just sealed in, this morning, she might still be there, but we really need to make sure the queen is there before we take any action. There's a good, nice size queen cell here now. This is an older queen cell. You can see it's way longer and it's starting to darken at the tip there as well. So that's telling me that that's about to emerge. Now, if you look at this, you probably only noticed that queen cell, but there's a second one over here. And I think there was a third one in around here somewhere. So you really need to brush the bees gently off them. Don't shake the, the, the frame. Brush the bees gently off or use the smoker to get the bees out of your way here. But you need to make sure that you identify or spot all queen cells if they're in the colony when you come to it. So again, this is the same frame with the bees cleared out of the way with the smoker. And that's that second queen cell there in the middle that I was talking about. Well, you probably didn't notice it with the bees clumped on top of it, but it's there at the same time. So what happens when bees swarm? Well, here they are taking off in the air and we can take a look at a video of that now in a second. And when the queen is clipped and marked in here, we see one that was clipped, her wing is clipped and she was marked. So she hit the ground when that swarm went into the air. And they can group anywhere. They can group on trees, branches, walls, on absolutely anything, go into wheelie bins. They will just go wherever they like. Here again, there's another group of them here, just bunched inside in a tree here on the grounds of this particular college. <laughs> again, if she hasn't been clipped, then they're going to dance around the place. And um, if she has been clipped and they can't find her, they'll go back into the colony again. And there they are on their way back in after losing the queen. If she isn't clipped, they're going to bunch up absolutely everywhere. And this is where you may have had two or three queen cells hatching out at the exact same time. And you end up with casts on different branches around the apiary. Now the bees here are being put back into, are take, been taken off a tree and being put back into um, a nuke box. And if you look here, you can see that the backside of the that honeybee is up in the air, exposing a white tip here at the end. And that white tip there releases um, a pheromone from the Nazanoff gland and that calls the other bees back. And you can see the bees over here are doing the exact same thing. 
So there's that bee with its backside up in the air, exposing the Nesanoff gland. That's a pheromone, again, that's being given off to call the other bees in to tell them the queen's inside the box. We found a new home over this way. Let's go. You don't want to cause trouble with your neighbours and you don't want them going into roofs, either the roof of your house or the roof of a neighbour's house, because it's a building job to get them out of it. What can we do to prevent that? Well, we can use a system of swarm control called an artificial swarm. And ultimately, we're going to take a look there now on the video of how to do an artificial swarm. Today, we're taking a look at how to make up an artificial swarm. And you need to have the colony as strong as possible. And here we see a colony with full supers on top of it. And just to show you what a full super is, we'll take one out there now, out of the box. And ultimately, there's a very fine balance between keeping the bees strong enough to make up the honey and avoiding swarming. So for starters, I'm just going to show you what a full super looks like on this colony before we take it off. You can see here the bees have it kept drawn out, filled with honey, and they've, kept, they've it nearly kept. They're actually out of space in this particular box, and we've probably left it too long now to give them more space. So we need to take a further look at this colony and see what sort of condition it's in down at the brood nest. So we're down as far as the brood nest, and that's the queen excluder. And I'm just going to give it a shot of smoke there to get the bees down out of the way so that I can actually go through the colony and have a quick look and inspect for queen cells. And already we can see that there are some queen cups starting there in the center uh, frames there. So I'm gently going to prise the frame out, knowing already that there is brood in all 10 frames here. So here on the first frame, we have bees and brood. And already I've come across a charged queen cell. So now I need to take action on this. So this is what my charged queen cell looks like. You can see it there. Um, there's actually a larvae in the middle of it. It's drawn way out further than anything else would be. So now that I found this, I actually need to go through the colony and find the queen. Before I do any more, I need to make sure that the queen is still present in this colony. So you can see the colony is boiling with bees and this is the strength we needed at uh, to get honey uh, into supers from the honeybees. So all I'm doing here now is looking for the queen and there you can see her. She has a long body, way longer than the other bees. And if you look down on top of her there, you'll see that there is a section already taken off her left wing. So she is clipped, but the mark has obviously worn off her. And you can see her there just wandering around inside the colony, looking for a cell to lay an egg in. So now I've actually identified the queen is there. I'm actually going to take her and that on that frame of brood and put it into a brand new box. So what I'm doing here is I have a brand new box of 10 frames because of the type of hive that's being used here. And I'm just taking a quick look here to make sure there are no other open queen cells on this frame. I didn't see them, but I'm taking a quick look. I've put the queen and the, um, the frame of brood into that box. And now I'm moving that over and I'm going to go to my, to my box in my original location and move that three feet away from where it was. And you can see it's absolutely boiling with bees. And this is the strength you want your colonies at. So now I'm going to put that queen on the one frame back in the original location. All the flying bees are going to come back to this location and they're going to bleed off that purplish box that we're looking at here right to the front of the screen. So now I need to go back. Uh, that's fine. I'm now going back to the original colony and I'm going to look for all the queen cells that are in it. So again, we're back to an open queen cell here that's charged. It's got a larvae inside in it and that larvae is going to turn into a queen. I'm only leaving one of these in this box and I need to knock down all the rest. So here we are, box closed up in a new location.
Now that we've put the artificial swarm together and made it up, we're left with the old queen in one box and a queen cell that is eventually going to hatch out in the second box. Once that new queen that eventually hatches out has been mated, we then have the option to combine the two hives for the honey flow or to have two separate colonies. Why is it so important that we control swarming? Well, if you take a look at the graph here um, and have a look here at the number of bees inside the colony at the end of April, start of May, they're just starting, the numbers are just starting to rise. And ultimately, as we said earlier, our, our goal here is to have the maximum amount of bees inside in the colony for the main flow at the end of June, start of July. If the bees swarm out, you're going to have an immediate drop in the colony numbers, and it's going to take a long time for the queen to get mated, the new queen to get mated, and the brood to hatch out, and the number of adult bees inside in the colony to rise up to any acceptable level. So while we needed the maximum amount of bees inside in the colony here, we won't have that if we have an, if the bees swarm out. And by the time the numbers of the bees in, and the brood inside in the colony rise up high enough, if this is our brood level here, and these number three here is the bee level inside in the colony, by the time the maximum amount of bees inside in the colony um, are there, the flow will be over. And that's our problem with honeybee swarming. And that's why you, you will hear beekeepers saying, if the swarm goes, you lose your crop of honey. So we can take advantage of that swarming instinct. And what exactly can we do? Well, we can make increase. And we can increase the number of our colonies with very little cost. The bees aren't going to make just one queen cell. They're going to hedge their bets. They're not going to put all their eggs in one basket. They're going to generate a number of queen cells at the same time on the basis that one or two of them will survive. And those new queens that we're going to rear from these colonies can replace winter losses or provide starter colonies for new beekeepers or help you to increase your honeybee stocks. And we can improve the characteristics of things like our bee health and the productivity of our colonies if we select accordingly um, based on our hive records. So we would be selecting for good healthy stocks, we would be selecting for high maybe honey productivity, or we may be selecting for temperament. So we need to go back to our hive records at all costs. And we only take queen cells from certain hives. We won't take them from all hives. So why have I said this? And which stocks am I going to take them from? I want to make sure the colonies are clear of disease. Acarine and nosema would be two of the main factors that I'd want to be sure that number one, my colony that I'm taking the queen cell from is clear of it. And the only way I will know that is by laboratory testing. And number two, I don't want stocks that are going to be made up from colonies with nosema because they're going to have other issues and the queens won't mate properly. Ideally, the stocks that you're going to use for the queen rearing and and harvesting the queen cells should be clear of chalk brood. So, some colonies are particularly susceptible to chalk brood and chalk brood is a fungus called Ascophera apis. Um, we see it in colonies during times of stress or if um, in particular beginners make up nukes and they don't make them up strong enough. The bees can't cover the brood inside in it and the brood dies and chalk brood breaks out. I might select for good honey producers. I might be specifically just looking for honeybees for producing honey. And temperament is always one of the characteristics or traits that a lot of beekeepers will select for. So we, these are queen cells that have been made here on a piece of um, comb. And we could select a few of them, one or two of them, um, and 
harvest a few of them. I wouldn't harvest all of them. I might harvest one or two over here. That one there in the middle will be difficult to get out and that one over there will be difficult to get out as well. So we might be able to harvest maybe two or three of them. And in order to harvest them, I would put them into cages like we're looking at here. So you could use this hair curler cage here with a holder and slide it into it and try not to shake it. So what I personally use is a bit of kingspan with holes in it. And I will sit those curler cages into the kingspan to carry them home. So that curler cage there would fit down into the kingspan and it would keep that cell warm while I'm going home with it if the apiary is not at my house. These ones here would do the job, all be perfect for doing the job, but there is a range of them available on the market. So these are the queen cells that I've harvested and brought home. They're in the curler cages. I've put a bit of tin foil around the end of it where I have cut it out of the cell or out of the brood nest. Um, and the tin foil is there as well to make sure that if any of those queens emerge, that they don't get at the other queens in the other cages. The natural instinct of the queen is to kill off these other queens here. So now if one of these queens hatches, she has plenty of space here inside in this um, to hatch out in. There will be a small bit of honey here at the end. And as soon as they hatch, I would give them bees or I would put them into a colony with other bees. The ideal thing here is that the bees would feed the queen. So here's a small cheap incubator. You set it at 35 degrees centigrade. You put water into the centerpiece here. So you can see it sitting here on the base. This holder here takes water and um, the humidity levels have to be at 50% inside this incubator. This is set at 35 degrees and the bees will hatch out there in a couple of days if you selected proper queen cells. So here's a photograph of one of those queens just after hatching out. And you can see that she's eaten her way out of the um, cell and the cover of the cell has flipped back again and it looks closed, but it's not, she has hatched out. And we have a small video to show you of one of these queens hatching out. So again, here's a queen inside in a queen cell after hatching out of the queen cup here. There will be a small bit of honey here at the bottom, but immediately she needs to be given bees to feed her. So with these newly hatched queens, you could make up this small box here called an apidea. And it would be three frames with a mug of bees, which would be about 300 bees. There's a queen excluder to go here so that the queen doesn't um, get drowned. And this is a syrup feeder here. So we could drop the queen cell in here, get a mug of bees into this. From, um, you could open it from underneath once you've, uh, you've put it all together. You can slide the bottom, turn it upside down, slide the bottom open, get your mug of bees in, put your queen cell in and close it up. Or I can put it into a nuke. Now, my preference is for a nuke, not for the apideas. And I'll explain that to you in just a moment. So ideally, my preference is for nukes. So I would put either a queen cell on a frame about to emerge or a hatch queen cell and three frames of brood in all stages into a nuke box and bring them to a new location. And once they're in that new location, the, follow, uh, the following day, then I would open the nuke box and let the bees out to forage. And you need to make sure that they have plenty of stores inside in that nuke box. So that nuke box needs bees. It needs frame of pollen and a frame of stores. Remember, whatever bees that you're going to put into this may not be of the right age to go foraging. So we have to give them a frame of pollen. 
Pollen is crucial to the queen for the first five or six days in the feeding. And it's in that five or six days that that will be the deciding time whether you have a good or a bad queen. If she has enough of pollen, her reproductive glands will mature properly and then she will get mated properly, provided we have a good window of weather. We obviously, obviously they're going to need a frame of stores in case the wind, in case the weather gets bad. Um, and but ultimately pollen here is very important. If I was had a hatched queen out of another colony and I might actually put her into one of these queen cages and put her into the nuke with a bit of fondant down here at the end and the bees will release her slowly out of the cage with the fondant. Now with the apodeas, after we've put the bees into the apodeas, we would leave them with plenty of food and in a dark place uh, for three, for two to three days. Uh, spraying the entrance here with water so they don't overheat. After three days then we can put them out because at that point those bees have come out of another colony, they will have gelled together and the hatched queen that's after coming out inside in the box there will be classed as one of their own. So how do I make up the apodea? Well, I ultimately need a mug of bees and a mug of bees is about 300 um, bees. So you just get a mug of bees, take them from the supers, um, close up the apodea and feed and um, add your queen cell or newly emerged queen. Now I would cage the queen if she's not from the same stock and she's already emerged, or you could just dip her in a bit of honey and run her in the door. The bees will clean the honey off her and the pheromone that she has then will go around the bees inside in that apodea. I'd leave them locked up in a dark room for three days, spraying to keep them cool. And after three days, late in the evening, I would put them out for mating and I would open the doors. Now the success rate. Normally, I would find about a 90% success rate with nukes, but I wouldn't get a great success rate with apodeas. And the success rate I would find with apodeas is only between 30 to 60%. Especially early in the season, I around this particular area, we seem to find a lot of absconding from apodeas early in the season. So, You've released the queen into the apodea, and then you put the apodea in the dark. And after three days, you put the apodea out into the location where it's there. It's going to stay for another two weeks at least to get mated. And go back now to what you learned about the life cycle of the queen. The queen hatches out on day 16. She needs another five days inside in the colony to build up her strength, to get her glands to mature so she's sexually mature for mating. And then she goes on mating flights and she may go once or she may go a number of times on mating flights in the middle of the day. Nice warm day, sunny day, temperatures 18 to 20 degrees are the optimum ideal times for it. And from there, she will head off to the drone congregation area. And once she gets mated and she takes the sperm into her spermatheca, uh, she will come back into the colony and she will start to give off a different pheromone to the bees. At that point, the bees will start to clear out honey from the center of the brood nest. So here we can see the honey is around the edge of that frame. That frame is upside down. It's a frame out of an apodea. They would have cleared the honey out of this area here and polished those cells, allowing the queen to start laying. So it's a minimum of 14 days before she would start laying inside in this box. And with nukes, it would be at least 21. With nukes, where you've given them a frame with brood on it, that queen won't start laying until all the brood has emerged. And that is one of the, mis the panic mistakes, I would say, that beginner beekeepers make. I made up a nuke, there's a queen cell in it, and they're expecting that queen to be mated in 21 days. She's unlikely to be mated in a nuke in 21 days. She will wait for all the brood to emerge first before she will start laying. That way the bees will have to accept her as their new queen. 
And it also gives her that extra week to mature properly. I feel personally that the bees that get mated in these apodeas here are forced to start laying too young because the apodeas are, are made up of a very small quantity of bees. Whereas with a nuke, you have a better balance of an overall population. And that's just my opinion on it and my experience of it. I'm sure some of you will disagree, but I would prefer to get them mated inside nukes and wait that extra week rather than get them mated in apodeas. So once the queen is mated, fully mated and out into um, a full colony, this is a beautiful frame of brood pattern is the best way I will describe this. This is just picture perfect. That line that you're looking at there is the line of wire that was inside in the frame that the queen didn't like. Um, other than that, this is absolutely spot on. Again, here's another co uh, colony with brand new frames inside in it. The queen um, has started laying there. Here, the wire is going up and down in these frames here. There's a few gaps in the middle here, but the brood pattern there isn't bad either. And this is the sort of thing that you're looking for when you're making up nukes. Clean frames, new frames, new wax, newly drawn wax. We can see worker brood here in the middle of that frame. And there's a small bit of drone brood out here on the edge of the frame here and over here on the edge of the frame there. But other than that, to me, that's a very nice frame of brood as well. Um, one of the things that you can come across is this kind of spotty brood pattern that we're looking at here. And this is not one of my photographs. This is a photograph that came off the Internet. But the reasoning for this would be where the queen has mated with drones that are too closely related to herself. We end up with um, what we would class as gaps in the brood pattern here or diploid drones. When we get brood pattern like this, we really need to do an estimation of um, the amount of drones that that queen would have mated with. So how do we do this? There's a scientific way of measuring this. You get a piece of cardboard and this piece of cardboard here is the exact same size as 100 cells. So ideally you would be going to a frame like this that is newly drawn out, brand new frame, um, where there is no pollen in the middle of it, there's no nothing in the middle of it, um, there is no chance that their pollen is blocking the gaps or anything else is blocking the gaps. It's purely done on um, brood cells only. And the more frames you do it across, the better balance you will get. So we've taken a kind of a, a square here, um, here with 100 cells, 10 cells by 10 cells, which is 100 cells in total. And we are going to get the percentage of brood solidness is measured directly. So we're basically going to count here the number of empty cells. Now, I see I can't class the cells that are in the diagram here with the pollen in them as empty cells because the queen couldn't lay them up because the pollen was in them. So by going to where the frame with the new brood or the brand new drawn out frame, we're going to get a more accurate reading. And what we're looking at here, depending on the percentages. So if we have 100 cells and 10 of them are empty, that would be a 90% brood pattern. And going by the graph here, that would mean that the queen mated with nine drones that have different sex alleles to herself. If we're down here at 80, she would have mated with four drones that had different sex alleles to herself that would give a 20% gap here in the brood vitality if we're down to this. And there is a certain level here where it's not viable for the colony to survive because the queen didn't mate with enough of drones unrelated to herself. And on that basis, the queen doesn't go to the same drone congregation area as the drones from her colony. In other words, she doesn't go to the same nightclub as her brothers. She will go to a different nightclub, hoping that she won't get mated with a drone or drones that are closely related to her. Um, so ultimately, she needs to be as promiscuous as possible and mate with as many unrelated drones as possible to get a maximum of brood vitality here inside in the colony. So 
we could get an average of 10 different measurements on newly drawn frames and then do an average on each frame of how many gaps were in each 10 centimeter or 10 by 10 um, box and then do out an average across the colony. And the higher the percentage, the better the gene pool diversity. If we get swarms, what do we do with them? Ideally, we have to move them to what I would class as a quarantine apiary. Another apiary well away from your own bees that you know are healthy. Bees in swarms carry disease. You don't know the varroa levels. You don't know the virus levels. You don't know if they're carrying um, other things like American fowl brood or European fowl brood. And really, you need to hive the colony in a quarantine apiary, leave it there for at least six weeks, and then send a sample off to a laboratory for testing for AFB, EFB and everything else. And when you get that swarm, ideally you should give it a treatment for Varroa while it's broodless. Then keep your quarantine apiary well away from everything. Because you need to ask yourself a load of questions when you get a swarm into a box or a you're called to a swarm. Do we know where it came from? The answer is no, I haven't a clue. Did I see it coming out of a, a box inside my apiary? That's fine. If I did, I know it came from that hive and it landed on a tree and I rehived it. That's a different story. But where it's coming from an unknown source, we need to quarantine the swarm. So bring it to an apiary that you would keep for quarantine your swarms only. Don't feed it for 48 hours. Bees before they swarm gorge on honey. And the idea of them gorging on honey is that when they fly out and they ball up in a colony on a tree or a branch of a tree and they're looking for this new hive location, once they find that hive location, their first job is to start building comb. So in the first 48 hours, they are going to start drawing out frames for honey storage and for the queen to lay. Any honey that they bring in their honey stomachs will be used up in that first 48 hours generating wax because there's a huge amount of food required to make wax. So they will have any uh, gut bacteria, any um, things like AFB or EFB that was in them then or in the honey will be used up and cleared out. After 48 hours then if you feel they need to be fed you can feed them. I would test them for acarine and I would test them for nosema once they get established. And I would send a sample off um, to DAFM or the authorized laboratory and test it for AF, test the brood once the queen starts laying for AFB and EFB.